Okay, hands up if this sounds like you. Chopin's nocturnes are the reason I started learning the piano. Yeah, I thought so. Well, I'm the same, so in tribute to these beloved musical companions, I decided to compile what I think are the most beautiful passages from each piece. But before we start, I'd like to give a big shout out to Richard Atkinson for the inspiration for this video. He's one of the main reasons I booted up this channel, so go subscribe to him if you haven't already. Okay, on with the video. For Chopin's youthful and melancholic first nocturne, I chose the passage in the dreamlike middle section, where the music reaches an expressive and dynamic apex. A rare fortissimo marks a jubilant theme which sings out atop an ever undulating left hand accompaniment. What's most striking here is the harmony. For 16 whole bars, the music is bathed in seventh tinged D flat major creating a hypnotic wash of sound which lends itself an almost modal quality. From out of this rich resonance, we hear the theme again, this time pianissimo and sapped of all that jubilation. The new third and fifth doublings could almost be evoking a faint horn call, as if the music is being heard from a great distance. Opus 9 number 2 is where my piano journey began, as evidenced by the many note names that litter my mum's copy of the score. One passage that always stood out to me in this most famous nocturne is the beginning of the coda, a tranquil four bars which serve both as a postlude for the preceding music and as material for the climax that follows. These delectable four bars are in two parts. The first part consists of an inversion of the main theme. And the second part consists of two large leaps, each decorated with an ornamental turn, which are then filled in with a stepwise descent almost as if Chopin's giving the singer a chance to show off here. And contributing to the calm, nocturnal atmosphere is the tonic pedal, which securely underpins the harmony for most of the extract. The most beautiful passage of the third nocturne also happens to be near the end. An upward surging scale over the dominant seems to promise an emphatic resolution to the piece. What we get, however, is an interrupted cadence and a slow climb back down that very same scale. The bass moves in contrary motion to this top line, gradually ascending until the two parts come to rest once again on the dominant. Having reached this pivotal chord, Chopin suspends musical time and treats us to a characteristically enchanting cadenza. A recurring minor sixth provides one final pang of tension before we finally get that perfect cadence and a proper resolution. A keyboard encapsulating gesture, 
the musical equivalent of drifting off under a canopy of stars. On to the Opus 15 set now, and for this fourth nocturne I'd like to highlight a passage right at the beginning. After a tranquil opening phrase, the music quickly wanders into darker territory. The melody, having just climbed up to a high A, now hesitantly descends. The left-hand accompaniment shadows this descent with some anguishingly beautiful chromatic harmony, the likes of which can also be found in the composer's famous fourth prelude. This harmony steers the music away from the tonic of F major and towards A minor, but at the very last second and with the deftest of harmonic manoeuvres, Chopin corrects course and resolves the music back to F. It's a stunning passage on its own, but it also plants an early seed of doubt which hangs over the otherwise sunny music and foreshadows the minor key storm that awaits. <laughs> Ever since I heard the fifth nocturne, I've been slightly obsessed with its middle section. It's magic. The right hand music is formed of an octave melody, and an inner voice harmonic filling. This wouldn't be so remarkable except that Chopin dislodges the lower note from the second octave, creating flowing quintuplets in the process. Like a written-out rubato, these figures of five float untethered from the left-hand accompaniment, lending the music an ethereal quality. Speaking of the accompaniment, we have sustained C-sharp dominant seventh harmony, just like our example from Opus 9 number 1. And like with the first nocturne, this static harmony helps build a dreamlike atmosphere, with the only unpleasant hint of reality perhaps being those A-naturals lurking in the inner voices. The music shifts up a minor third and the dream starts to dissipate. Gone are the quintuplets, meaning that the right hand now syncs up with the left, and gone is the stable 5-1 bass movement, which is now replaced with the considerably less stable third inversion E dominant seventh. This all culminates in a reverie shattering climax and a slow fall back down to earth. Chopin's sixth nocturne is a peculiar one, and the first where he truly breaks from the John Field formula. So, no more arpeggiated accompaniment, and no more ternary form. Instead, the work plays host to two juxtaposed genres, a sombre mazurka, and a sublime chorale and it's the sacred latter which I'd like to highlight. 
Marked religioso, this music consists of a hymnal tune in four-part homophony and with unadorned harmonization. It's simple, and that's precisely what makes it so beautiful. With the Opus 27 set, Chopin elevates the genre above and beyond Field's original model, leaving David de Boulle to suggest that they might be better described as ballads in miniature. A duet runs through much of the gloomy Opus 27 number no. 1. but it's only after great musical strife and turmoil that it finally blossoms near the end. Unlike the previous contrapuntal passage, here the voices sing fully entwined in thirds. Together with the expansive left-hand arpeggios, this exquisite pairing outlines the tonic major of C-sharp, which, considering the piece starts in the minor, lends the music a profound darkness-to-light motif. The duet winds down gradually, leading to the first plagal cadence of the series and a moving 4-3 suspension to finish the piece off. We're in real S-tier territory now. The Eighth Nocturne is one of my personal favourites, so it was practically impossible to choose just one passage. I'll give an honourable mention to the astonishing cadenza just after the midway point. Overall though, I've got to go with an earlier passage the masterfully crafted, angst-ridden build-up to the recapitulation. In just a handful of bars, Chopin takes the music from blissful, tonally distant A major through an operatic scale drama to one of his most glorious reprises, back in the home key of D-flat. He achieves this using the work's two main themes. The B theme, which originally sounds like this, comprises the first half, except here it's in the tonic minor, rhythmically more intense, and underpinned by an ominous dominant pedal that keeps the music locked in suspense. Fragments of the A theme, which originally sound like this, comprise the second half, and repeat four whole times to really ramp up the tension. As these theatrical gestures repeat, we're treated to a masterclass in chromatic harmony, replete with ascending bass, descending tenor, all of which miraculously culminate in the perfect cadence which marks the return of the A theme and the return of the tonic.
on to Opus 32 number 1 now, which is arguably the calmest, least dramatic nocturne of the set. Until the ending, that is. Like the chorale in Opus 15 number 3, Chopin once again mixes genres by ending the piece with an enigmatic, tonic minor recitative. This is obviously a standout passage, one which could be worth a deep dive in a separate video, but I wouldn't call it beautiful, at least not like the extracts we've heard so far. So instead, I've gone with the work's third theme, characterised by duet-like imitation, and singing thirds reminiscent of the Opus 27 nocturnes. I love that with just one note, the music shifts to the relative minor, giving us a new and bleak perspective on the material we just heard. Next is number 10, and we have the first instance of a chordal introduction, something that features in three of the other nocturnes. This simple but meltingly gorgeous cadence establishes the key, mood, the singer's note, and serves as a musical once upon a time. What's special here, though, is that Chopin returns to this material at the very end, imbuing these delicate sonorities with profound structural significance. It may look and sound the same, but listen to the whole piece, and this intro-outro takes on whole new depths of meaning. We are around halfway through now, and the Opus 37 set signals a shift in the composer's approach to left-hand accompaniments. The nocturnes written up until this point mainly feature various types of broken chord figuration. But the remaining nocturnes feature this pattern far less with Chopin now frequently making use of a pendulum figuration that swings between bass note and chord. Such an accompaniment characterises our 11th nocturne, a gloomy ternary piece which actually calls back to the 6th nocturne in a couple of ways. There's the tonality of G minor, but more interesting than that is the chorale, which comprises the work's middle section. Like with the earlier nocturne, this singable, harmonically and rhythmically straightforward music evokes religion. The bass line looks like Chopin may even have had the organ's foot pedals in mind. This otherwise warm and consoling E-flat major music is slowly brought back to stark reality, when a series of fermatas cause the hymn to falter. The tune, now fragmented, is reharmonized to end on the tragic relative minor.
There's yet more genre meddling in the Twelfth Nocturne, a Venetian barcarolle that can start to sound like an etude if played any faster than Andantino. <laughs> The most beautiful passage of this work is the sublime, lilting second theme, which intersperses and contrasts with the first. Initially in C, a tonality seldom found in the set, the tune is formed of a yodeling figure and expressive descent, all of which emphasize pentatonic scale degrees. This relatively simple music is subjected to an anything but simple modulatory scheme. Let's listen while keeping track of all the keys that are referenced. So, what do we get if we tally up all those keys? Forget the circle of fifths, we've got a whole tone scale. It'll be some time before this scale starts to feature prominently in classical music, but this is one early, illuminating example of it operating cleverly in the background. We're back in S-tier territory with Opus 48 number 1, an epic work with just an abundance of exquisite passages to choose from. One such passage is the celestial chorale that forms the middle section. Proclaimed, according to Kleczynski, not by a feeble piano, but by a mighty organ midst the sound of trombones and kettle drums. <laughs> section, but seeing as we've already covered two chorales in the video, I'm going to go with another passage, the monumental reprise of the main theme that follows immediately after. With the nocturnes up until this point, Chopin would usually vary and intensify a main theme through increasingly elaborate ornamentation. With this nocturne, however, he goes a step further by utterly transforming the texture replacing the dirge-like pendulum accompaniment from the beginning with a restless triplet chord pattern, and enriching the delicate aria with full repeating chords in the treble. Add to this the doubling of tempo and the frequent and frenzied 4v3 polyrhythm, and we have some of Chopin's most texturally dense and emotionally agonized music. Have a listen to the transformation.
all this culminates in a colossal, fate-defying, interrupted cadence, before the music, ever more sapped of spirit, reaches the cadence proper and a haunting ascension of soul motif. For the somewhat neglected 14th Nocturne, Chopin weaves an arrestingly hypnotic, never-ending melody, whose phrase ends and phrase beginnings blend dreamily into one. So continuous is this tune and flowing triplet accompaniment that their abrupt absence towards the end of the piece provides one of the most striking and haunting moments. After an anxious four bars bereft of direction, the texture to which we've grown so accustomed suddenly cuts out, leaving a high, lonely voice to meander down before coming to rest on the dominant. The music, which was so disjunct and agitated, is now quiet and seems resigned to stoically accept the harmonic and emotional destination at hand. pattern established thus far is that the major key nocturnes usually feature a central minor key episode, whereas the minor key nocturnes usually feature a major key episode, a completely logical scheme which forms the tonal blueprints for much ternary form music. However, our 15th nocturne deviates from this formula, starting in solemn F minor with a pondering aria, Chopin completely foregoes a major key middle section and the respite that would provide. Instead, he unfolds a furious passage which straddles three related minor tonalities. He 
then introduces yet more minor key material, an anguished contrapuntal passage back in the tonic, which is well worth a closer look. Diminished sevenths offer an unstable accompaniment to a duet comprised of a higher voice struggling ever upwards and a lower voice in near constant decline. Upon closer inspection, the voices in fact resemble various parts of the main theme. The top seems derived from the dominant decorating tail end of the melody. whereas the bottom line quite clearly comes from the initial descending fourth portion of the melody. This all builds suspensefully to a climax on the Neapolitan, where we hear that descending fourth cry out in full-blooded chords. Has the music reversed fortunes, or will it succumb to its downfall? You be the judge. Next is Chopin's rhapsodic 16th Nocturne, and I'm embarrassed to say that up until recently, I didn't get it. Where does the melody begin? Where does the melody end? Why doesn't it modulate? Will this left hand ever stop? I'm happy to report that it makes a lot more sense to me now. I realise that what articulates the structure and drives the emotional momentum is a duet. Chopin introduces the pair early on, and we get a taste for their somewhat fractious relationship. Like the previous nocturne, we have a lower voice that insists downwards, and a higher voice which soars upwards. Now hear my favourite passage, the rapturous recapitulation with both voices chromatically infused and with the emotional dial turned up to 11. Chopin was only in his mid-thirties when he wrote the Opus 62 Nocturnes, but owing to his tragically premature death only a few years later, they are considered a product of his late style, a compositional period which saw the composer at his most contrapuntal, harmonically adventurous, and arguably his most ingenious. For the 17th Nocturne in B major, I'm for the second time in a row going to highlight the recapitulation of the main theme. It's sublime when it first appears, arranged in rich four-part harmony and with left and right hands holding equal melodic status.
but after a searching operatic middle section in the key of the submediant, the theme returns utterly transcended. Every note of the melody is now embellished with luminescent trills, creating a magical vibrato effect. What's so touching is that here, towards the end of his life, and in his penultimate nocturne, Chopin briefly allows the piano to become a fully sustaining instrument. This coloristic effect may have inspired Ravel when writing his piano concerto in G major. Take a listen to the cadenza of the first movement. And now, on to the last nocturne the composer ever wrote, the intimately expressive and structurally profound Opus 62, number 2, in E major. There are elements of that familiar ternary design, a main theme, contrasting middle in the relative minor, but Chopin inserts an additional theme to link these main architectural strands together. The melody here is as beautiful as it is simple, climbing shyly up and down one to three before becoming more active and declamatory as it moves towards the middle section. The left-hand accompaniment is not like any we've seen before. Rising scalic figures whose wave-like contour articulates an almost Bach style of horizontal harmony. After the minor key middle section, the main theme returns, but in drastically different fashion. The melody is fragmented and sequenced, all the while there's no explicit statement of the tonic, E major. This truncated and developmental version of the theme soon builds to a cadence, and what better to deliver this sought-after tonic resolution than our passage from earlier? It's much the same, except this time more rhythmically and contrapuntally intense. Furthermore, it's now used to end the piece, so what was once left open-ended is now resolved, and what an astonishing resolution it is.
Chopin's tragic E minor nocturne may have been the 19th published, but it was in fact likely the first to be written when the composer was just 17. It's an absolute gem, but one passage that's always stood out to me is the heart-rendingly beautiful second theme, situated within the eye of the emotional storm. Singing thirds carry the melody, a duet texture we've seen developed in several of the later nocturnes, whilst a rainbow accompaniment bathes the music in tranquil major harmony, fixed above a stabilising pedal tone. This reverie does not go undisturbed, however. Flirtations with the minor mode provide an ominous glimpse of what's to come. As Chopin steers the music back towards the main theme, diminished harmonies replace the formerly lush ones, as the B major mirage starts to give way to the E minor reality. conclude today's video with the posthumous C-sharp minor nocturne, introduced to many through its narratively profound use in the devastating Holocaust biopic, The Pianist. I could highlight any one bar from this long and sighing aria, but what I find hauntingly beautiful is when the song essentially ends, leaving in its absence ghostly scales which wander up and down the register. With only these bare pianistic ingredients, Chopin casts a completely desolate atmosphere. But this isn't the end. With just a single note, the redemptive Picardy third, the composer offers a ray of hope, just as the hands drift apart in major key bliss. And that's my selection, but I'd love to hear yours, so do let me know in the comments what your favourite passages are. Big thank you to all the wonderfully talented pianists who agreed to take part in today's video. You can find their full performances and details in the video description. Thanks to you as well for watching and for your support. Hopefully I'll see you again soon. <laughs>